Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's conversation with Hillary Tompkins. I'm Chris Field, director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, the organizer for today's event. The Woods Institute is Stanford's marquee investment in advancing, understanding, and developing practical solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. Today's session is part of our series of informal chats with people who've really moved the needle on major environmental issues, and it's part of our celebration of Earth Week. Stanford has a cornucopia of Earth Week events, including a panel discussion on human and planetary health tomorrow at 1030. The Woods website lists additional Stanford Earth Week events. In today's webinar, I'm excited to talk with Hillary Tompkins. Hillary is a graduate of the Stanford Law School, and she was inducted into Stanford's Native American Cultural Center's Alumni Hall of Fame in 2009. Currently, Hillary is a partner at Washington, D.C. law firm of Hogan Lovells. Her practice focuses on public lands, natural resources, and Native American affairs, with emphasis on environmental energy and natural resource matters. Before going to Hogan Lovells, Hillary was appointed by former President Barack Obama as solicitor of the U.S. Department of the Interior. She's the first Native American to hold this position, which she held for more than seven years. Before serving as DOI solicitor, Hillary held positions as counsel to New Mexico's governor, special assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of New York, and as an honors program trial attorney in the Environment and Natural Resource Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Hillary is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. The format for today's conversation is that I'll start with a few questions. After about 25 minutes, we'll get to the good part, questions from all of you in the audience. To get a question into the queue, type it at any time into the Q&A box using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can. After the webinar, we'll draft answers to any unanswered questions and post them on the Woods website. Hillary, let me start with a question about how you ended up at Stanford Law School. Yeah, so it was really uh, a wonderful decision I made to go to Stanford Law. I was living on my tribe's reservation in Window Rock, Arizona, and uh, had a lot of time on my hands to apply to law school. Um, I uh, took the LSAT and then applied to a bunch of schools, some in the Northeast and then some, um, well, one in the West, California, Stanford, and uh, was really fortunate to get accepted to Stanford. and. Um, I had a, to have you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it was just a really, really tremendous. And so they offered to have me come visit to see the campus. And so they were very smart to do that. Um, and then I had another option to go back to New England. I went to uh, Dartmouth undergrad. Um, so I was familiar with New England weather. Um, and uh, so I kind of knew what that would entail. So I went to visit Palo Alto and that was done deal. I was um, met with a lot of incredible students, uh, was really drawn to the strong Native American program too. Um, so that's how I ended up uh, at Stanford and the Palm Drive really helped. <laughs> that's great, thanks. So, and, 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 and tell me how the training that you got at Stanford has influenced your work. Yeah, so what I think was really unique about Stanford is that it is so small, the law school, just over a hundred students and a lot of students from different backgrounds um, and the ability to take a lot of different classes. Like I love that about Stanford, you know, you have your core curriculum that you're supposed to, you know, that you need to take, but then you can explore. Um, and definitely Professor Buzz Thompson had a huge influence on me. He you know, told me about his uh, focus on environmental law, and that was really intriguing to me. Uh, so taking his class just opened up that new area of expertise, and, and I loved it and was inspired by his class. Um, and that really propelled me to, to stay focused in that area. The other thing that was really cool about Stanford Law was that they did a class uh, one semester with the Navajo Nation uh, Supreme Court Justice, Raymond Austin. And he came and taught Navajo traditional law, which is our 
traditional body of law based on our culture uh, and our um, legal system. And that was fabulous. And that was really amazing to be at this elite law school, learning about my own tribe and learning about our own legal system. So that had a huge influence on me as well. It made me like really proud, you know, about our traditional knowledge and, and being a native person um, entering into the legal field. And of course, Buzz Thompson is one of the founding co-directors of the Woods Institute. So we both owe a lot in our career to, to yes. Buzz's work. I, I'm really interested in, in the concept of Navajo law and how that relates to the rest of your career. Could you talk a little bit about what some of the core principles of Navajo law are? Oh, yes, sure. And, and I actually would talk a lot about this when I was solicitor uh, of Interior because I saw there was a lot of opportunities to apply Navajo traditional law. One of the bedrock principles is throughout life, striving for harmony in your life. Um, and it's called Hojo. And you, your life goal, every person's life goal is to be in balance, to walk in beauty. You maybe have heard that uh, as a Navajo saying. And in a very simple way, it's your right side of your body is your peace way, your left side is your war way. And they are always in flux. Uh, you can't have full peace without having some struggle. Uh, and life struggles also help you find peace. Um, so they're, they're both essential, but it's a matter of how you balance those. And I think a lot of legal issues and conflicts um, and issues about uh, restoring, healing, reconciliation is very similar to that Navajo principle of Hojo. So I, I use that a lot in my work uh, when I can, you know, see a new challenge. Um, how can we restore balance and peace to this situation? And of course, now we're fortunate to have the first Native American secretary at the Department of Interior. Have, have you seen that these concepts have already illuminated the philosophy that Deb Holland is bringing to Interior? Yeah, and first of all, that is just incredible. It's just so wonderful to see um, the first Native American cabinet secretary. And I know Deb, you know, she's from New Mexico and it's just really, really inspiring uh, to people like myself and other Native Americans um, to see that, you know, we should be part of the leadership structure of this country. And she is bringing those principles to the table. You know, she's from Laguna Pueblo and they have their own unique, you know, culture and language and beliefs but I have heard her and I've talked with her about issues like Bears Ears National Monument. She just went to go visit there in Southeastern Utah. And that's actually an issue in litigation, um, an issue where two presidents had different views about the scope of protection of this sacred place. Obama set the monument, designated the monument and then President Trump reduced the size of the monument. And when she went to visit last week, I think it was, she, um, you know, talked about how it's important we make decisions about our public lands for all Americans and all future generations and that there's a lot of power in this place. Um, and so I do see her bringing those values and concepts to the table um, in her leadership role, which is really, it's nice to have that perspective as part of the conversation. You know, especially during Earth Week, but really in the uh, era of the 21st century, we do face incredible challenges to strike a balance between protecting natural assets, especially incredible resources like Bears Ears, and providing renewable energy. And of course, the Department of Interior oversees so much uh, energy production, whether it's from renewables or fossil fuels. So how, do, how do you see the philosophy of the past and the philosophy going forward about balancing the protection, the extraction missions of the Department of Interior. Yeah, and that's something we dealt with every day and they're dealing with now. Um, it's kind of the epitome of the Interior Department. Uh, Interior is really unique in that they have 
multi-missioned mandates that are conflicting sometimes. Uh, you know, you have the um, Bureau of Land Management that's responsible for management of the public lands, um, but also Fish and Wildlife Service that has obligations to protect species. You have the Tribal Trust Responsibility, Bureau of Reclamation managing Western water systems. So I would say on a daily basis, there was those different conflicting missions would come into play. And so I, you know, I think the good news is that um, a lot of the statutes that Interior operates under, and I don't want to get too lawyerly here, but um, there is though this, there's a basis for Interior to say, in this place, we are going to focus on conservation and protection and stewardship. Uh, these public lands are all Americans' lands, and we need to preserve them for future generations and to help with issues of, you know, ecosystem management, that balance in the universe. And then there's also authority, though, to develop the public lands for energy resources. And there's discretion for Interior to decide are we going to focus on fossil fuels? Are we going to focus on renewables, which we're seeing in, in this administration, that is a top priority, citing uh, renewables on um, public land, solar and wind. Um, and the key is uh, finding the locations to do those projects, those energy projects that minimize the impacts to environmental cultural resources. But it's my belief that you know, Interior does have the legal statutory tools to figure out how to make, to strike that balance. Where it gets tricky is when I think, when it does appear out of balance, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we see that with some of the issues, like we saw with, um, you know, right now they're talking about Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Sure. It's a great yeah. example. Can you, can you speak a little bit about the way that the Department of Interior thinks about, um, this issue of of what should be protected and what should be developed in the context of what are the what are the science inputs, what are the cultural inputs, and what are the economic inputs, and are are, are there additional things that need to be brought in beyond those three core ones? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of things at, at, at play. Um, definitely, the science is a huge driver, and a lot of it is. You know, under NEPA and the ESA, a little different standards, but you're kind of operating with the current state of science, right? So science definitely plays a part, but one of the things that we would grapple with is what do we not know and how much experimentation can occur in our decision-making um, to move and evolve. But science is an input Definitely sacred sites and cultural resources is an input. Um, also kind of weighing, can we, the thing that is challenging is what can be made permanent. So like national parks, they're permanently designated by Congress for the purpose of protecting those areas for, for their mission. Um, Bureau of Land Management's a little different because some of the protections could be temporary because they're not regulatory, they're not statutory. So you can protect certain areas like an ACEC, um, area of critical environmental concern, uh, but it's not permanent. Same with like wilderness study areas. You can give them some interim protection. You can withdraw land for an inter interim period of time, but it's not permanent. And a lot of times interior has to go to Congress to get that permanent protection. So that's a factor at play um, that I think is kind of also at this root of, of the debate about what to do with public lands. Cause there is that discretion I was talking about where you can go from protection to development and back to protection and, and that sort of thing. So it's a little bit of a challenge. So I think it's important to identify and build um, coalitions and community around those areas that there is a sense of, yes, we need to protect this um, and then get that permanent protection. And, and one community whose voices haven't 
been heard enough historically as Native Americans. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if you can speak to where we are in terms of recognizing important cultural and, and spiritual sites in especially the Southwest and what else might be done in order to provide the kind of permanent protection that we provide to national parks and monuments? Yeah, so there, you know, I definitely think only recently have Native voices been heard on these issues. Even when I was there under President Obama, as a Native woman in a leadership role, you know, that was new. And to kind of bring that Native perspective to the table was new and you know, sometimes I could tell it was a little unsettling to folks um, who are, you know, everyone's got um, good intent, but um, it's a change. And I, so I think, first of all, it's important to evaluate um, how can Native perspectives, traditional knowledge, I mean, a lot of the issues we're facing with climate change, there's traditional teachings and knowledge that can help create resiliency and sustainability um, out in, in the environments that in America that we are managing. Um, also, I think looking at co-management of tribes with like national parks or national wildlife refuges um, is a very important uh, area of focus because these lands used to be tribal lands, right? Um, and then I think in addition, uh, getting permanent protection for areas. A good example is Badger Chew Medicine up in near Glacier National Park. That was one of the cases we worked on and we canceled oil and gas leases in that area. And there was one holdout who litigated and, and wanted to keep their lease. Um, and, you know, that there was like Congress had already withdrawn that, that area from future leasing. Um, that's an area that's been talked about for either a national monument designation or legislation. It's a sacred area to the Blackfeet Nation. Um, so I think there are those places across the country where it, it's the right thing to do. And it would be, a, you know, go a long way to like give that permanent protection there. You, you already mentioned the concept of tribal co-management of some Department of Interior lands. And I, I wonder if that's kind of an ascendant theme and kind of what, what might be the possibilities for that? And, and what are the limitations of thinking about um, a, a more robust integration of tribal decision making into federal lands management? Yeah, well, there's been a little bit of it through uh, intergovernmental agreements between like the park service and tribes. But again, it doesn't have that permanence and they can be, you know, ended if there's a new point of view that says, no, we don't want to work with the tribes on this. Um, so I do think there's a need for some legislative language to authorize interior agencies to engage in co-management. I think that would be um, really key to give it some teeth. And then for instance, at Navajo, we have Canyon de Chez, right? A, a national park right in the middle of the reservation. Um, and I think that's a great example of where, you know, providing for Navajo uh, co-management of that park uh, would benefit not only, you know, the Navajo Nation from getting all of that local knowledge uh, and um, perspective, uh, but also would be great for the Navajo Nation to have, you know, to have the ability to, to manage a place that they know better than anybody. Um, so I think that, again, that there's places where we can make these um, partnerships with Indian country instead of you know, at Interior, a lot of times it was like, oh, we can't do that. We don't have the authority to do that, that sort of thing. Um, and that can overcomplicate things. So I think getting tribes to have some of that statutory authority to engage in that way with their federal, um, with the federal government would be a good change and a needed change.
And it's impressive to think about what people like you with your background in both um, uh, U.S. constitutional law and 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 uh, and tribal issues can bring to the table. Do you, do you think, in, in general, we're we're at a stage now where we can have the kind of sophisticated conversations that are necessary, where where we can really find the overlaps between the legal and cultural values of the federal government and the tribes. I think we're getting there. Um... I think that that what is really going to be essential, and I saw this with the um, when I first started, going back to two thousand and nine, when I first started as solicitor, there was the Cobell breach of trust case, and then over a hundred tribes had sued Interior for breach of trust. So there was just a complete breakdown in that relationship, um, and no trust, and acrimony, in fact. Um, and we were able to settle most of that, most of those cases in the first, um, well, Cobell was the first six months. But I think what is going to be key is somehow dealing with the history. And there's just a lot of history, um, a lot of, you know, grounds for mistrust. And I think it's going to involve having people who are open to listening and hearing about um, what Native people have been through and then how to make it better moving forward with Native people providing informed consent and um, being equal partners because it's been such a long history of like the dominant society affecting, you know, the lives of native people without consent. And so I think that, that has to, you know, I think we did some of that under the Obama administration, but I think more of that has to happen to then start to build these partnerships and trust to do the, these projects together. Um, I think that's an essential part of it. And it seems like people like you who were fluent in the in the native values and, and fluent in the dominant legal system are really critical in, in making that happen. Or do we are the paths open for having additional scholars follow your pathway? Yeah, I mean, you know, and it's funny, I didn't plan my path, right? It just kind of happened. I mean, going to Stanford just opened huge doors for me. And even at Interior, there were a bunch of Stanford law grads who were, you know, great mentors to me. Um, and it's exciting to see that Native people are assuming these leadership roles in the federal government, um, in state governments, uh, hopefully more in the judicial branch. Um, we're seeing folks in Congress. So it's starting to happen slowly but surely, right? And, and having those people who can kind of build those bridges um, with, you know, it was key. It was key that folks have some authority, right? Um, and being solicitor, you know, that was helpful to be able to, you know, have have that role and be able to say, this is what we're gonna do in this particular lawsuit, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think it's changing um, and I hope it's changing for, for the better. Um, so support folks that you see that are out there that are you know, trying to be uh, tra trailblazers and barrier breakers, because it matters. Maybe, maybe you could say a little bit more about what you do as solicitor for, uh for a government department and, and um, you know, the extent to which you're sort of wielding the power of law in order to push policies ahead versus looking internally to make sure that the, the, the department is, is true to its values. Yeah, so the solicitor role, um, you know, it's chief counsel for interior representing all the bureaus of interior. And so what I would do would 
work, I'd work really closely with the interior leadership to look at things like, are we gonna regulate uh, methane emissions from oil and gas operations on public lands? And there's, there's a history of the department's position on that issue. So what I would do is look at that history, look at the regulations, look at the statute. Do we have the power to regulate um, emissions on public lands and formulate that legal rationale and theory? And is it viable? And so that's what I would do in every sector imaginable. Um, do we have the authority to regulate hydraulic fracking, for instance? Um, or is that an EPA role, right? And there were some judges out west that disagreed with us on that. Um, but there's other judges that agree. Uh, you know, what's our duties under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act? Um, can you be prosecuted for accidental killing of a bird, a migratory bird? And I looked at that issue and there had been decades of interior department legal memos and positions saying, yes, we do have a, that authority. Um, so that's how you can make policy through the law uh, to, and, and the solicitor is, you know, you can issue M opinions, legal opinions, mm -hmm. and then they're, they're binding on the department uh, in terms of the legal position of the department. So I would issue M opinions on, on various natural resource law questions. And, and with that as background, we're looking at a whole bunch of uh, possibilities, let's say, over the coming years, and including the nation's ambitions to uh, achieve 30 by 30, 30% 30 of lands mm -hmm. and waters protected by, by 2030. And of course, many of the lands are controlled through the Department of Interior. How do you see that agenda unfolding? Yeah, I, I see it as... Um, a little bit about what we were chatting about earlier, which is where are the places that there is local support, tribal support, um, as well as uh, interior department support for protecting landscapes. And I think that some of the work we did under the Obama administration identified those landscapes um, and being sure that that it's the right place with the right uh, community and local support is important. Using the Antiquities Act, the president has the power under the Antiquities Act to designate national monuments. Um, and so there are a lot of candidates out there that I'm sure the current Biden team is looking at um, for such designation. Um, but the key is, to, and, and this is based on my experience at Interior, I think the key is to, to find those places where there is consensus because otherwise you will get litigation. You'll, you, you'll, and we were sued every three days. We used to joke that we were sued probably every three days <laughs> we were there. Um, but so for 30 by 30, there are tools in Interior's toolbox to set aside these landscapes. Um, but again, it's that balancing between the very different um, multi-mission toolbox that Interior has. And if I understand correctly, one of your current jobs might occasionally involve suing the Department of Interior for uh, not, not uh, being true to their mission. Is that right? Yeah, well, I haven't, you know, I haven't been out there filing complaints <laughs> against Interior, but sometimes clients will, will definitely call because they have litigation pending with the department for sure. Um, and, you know, I do have folks call who are thinking about suing the department. Um, and, and in my view, it, I think it's important again, and maybe this is my Navajo philosophy coming into play, to have conversations first. Uh, you know, talk with the, the opponent, see if you're really understanding each other on these issues, which often you are, uh, but it's, it's worth trying. Um, when I was there, it was amazing to me how many issues had been dormant for 10 years or plus that laid unresolved. Um, and often we would ask, you know, lawyers would come in and 
do a good job being zealous advocates for their client. And we would say, well, have you talked to the opposing side? It might've been like a third party, you know, not interior. And they would say, no. <laughs> I was like, come on, give them a call, you know? Um, and then sometimes we would find they actually didn't understand what the other side was saying. It, it's, it was amazing. So anyway, I think it's worth having that communication um, before you get into court also, because then DOJ takes over mm -hmm. and, yeah. and interiors. Yeah. It, interiors, all that discretion and kind of policy making, it gets very, very tricky once something gets into court. Mm -hmm. Do you think that 30 by 30 is feasible goal? I do. You know, there's a lot of um, public lands, real estate out there. Um, and a lot of it has great potential for being um, part of the climate solution and carbon sequestration, um, carbon capture. Uh, and I think that interestingly enough, a lot of it too, a, a lot of the public lands are very close to tribal lands. Um, and tribes, many tribes have been doing a phenomenal job with managing for climate and, and all of those issues. Um, so I could see that there's, you know, trying to find where there's that symbiotic relationship in terms of 30 by 30. Um, I think I think they're going to be looking at that. I, I, I do want to turn to questions from the audience in just yeah, sure. one minute. We've got um, a bunch of questions and let me encourage audience members to add more. But I, I want to ask one more thing just as, as we make the transition. Sure. So we're looking at very ambitious national goals for renewable energy generation and at um, natural climate solutions and a protection of important landscapes. And uh, there are real challenges in figuring out how to prioritize areas. We've talked about many aspects of that. But if we look at a dramatic expansion, especially in lands that are used for renewable energy production, how, how do we integrate those into this bigger vision of uh, cooperation with, with tribes, emphasis on culturally important sites, expanding the protected lands at the same time we're generating more energy? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of that homework has been done um, under the Obama administration. We identified uh, renewable zones on public lands. And of course, you know, there are always going to be updating those to make sure that they're current and based on new science and uh, based on surveys of the areas. But um, there already has been identified those areas that are suitable for renewables on public lands. Um, and then adjustments can be made with each project, you know should there be issues with cultural resources or um, historic preservation act issues um, uh, those types of things so i think every you know you go go from this massive uh, scale of land management planning which is what blm does and then you go to your site specific planning as well and it's at the site specific project specific level that then you get into um, around the edges, there might be issues that BLM, tribes, the developer can work out um, to make it kind of a workable project from that perspective. Um, I do think it's important that Interior has those conversations, you know, early in that process, that decision-making process too. What, one thing I, I, I think is often under-discussed is that renewable energy resources tend to be distributed very broadly and there's not a huge difference between the solar potential in location A and location B. It's not like an ore body or, um, mm -hmm. or a, a stream where uh, if, you, if you're gonna access this particular mineral that has to be in this location. So I think there's just more flexibility about uh, planning. It can be more sensitive. Yes, and, and I think, but to your question, there are tribes that have been in fossil fuel, um, you know, the, the government decided we're going to do fossil fuel development on your reservation, Navajo is one of them. And I think it'll be important to look 
to opportunities to transition into renewables um, for those tribes that are interested. Uh, and a lot of the infrastructure, the transmission infrastructure is there um, and the demand is there. You know, Navajo's uh, coal power plant, you know, was servicing a lot of the municipalities in the Southwest and in California. So uh, I think they'll be looking at those areas as well. Okay, I'm gonna to turn to uh, questions from the audience now. I'm gonna start with one from Rose Monahan. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Tompkins. I found your words really inspiring. Me too, by the way. You mentioned co-management of public lands and national parks between the federal government and tribal governments. I'm wondering if there are other areas of partnership that you think should be enhanced, reimagined, and or prioritized, whether under DOI's jurisdiction or some other jurisdiction. Yeah, definitely in the um, water management area. I did a lot of work in New Mexico before I went to Interior on Rio Grande water issues with the Pueblos and the state and local governments. And I think there, there really needs to be a push, I would say, to, to find how to work together on these river basins out west uh, where tribes can be part of the solution. They have the senior water right on the river. Uh, one of the things when I represented Pueblos in New Mexico, we were fighting for the right to store, store water. Um, they used to store water for the Pueblos and then release it every year, which is like when, we, when we're in a drought situation and other folks might need that water or you need to save it. Um, so things like that. Another area I see where there could be collaboration between the government and tribes is with the Department of Justice. And we did a little bit of this when I was there, but we frankly kind of ran out of time, which is having the US be a co-plaintiff with the tribes and bring suits to protect tribal treaty rights, land rights, um, other interests as well. Uh, there's an interesting, Thing with Department of Justice in the United States, which is they, they only take one legal position in court and in cases. Um, so I think looking at where do tribes fit into that will, will be important as well. Were there particular cases that you thought really changed the direction of the way we think about uh, legal actions related to natural lands? Yeah, oh my gosh. Yes, I mean, we we did uh, had cases before the Supreme Court on the rights of the you know Park Service to manage waters that go through um, you know park lands and state lands, uh, significant cases on the Endangered Species Act and uh, our authority to regulate uh, habitat. Um, that not, wasn't necessarily tied to public lands. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on in terms of uh, a lot of evaluation of our assessment of climate change under NEPA. And actually under the Obama administration, uh, a lot of people don't know this. We said the science isn't there to know that if we authorize this coal plant, with, that it will have this impact on climate directly, um, which I think will likely evolve uh, over time. But a, a lot of cases influencing um, what our legal obligations are in, in the government to look at those issues like climate. Let, let me ask a question that, that speaks to um, the, your personal role in some of those uh, interactions. And so this one's yeah. from uh, I don't have the name of the person, but as a tribal member, how did you balance upholding laws yeah. of EOI with actions that could potentially harm native communities, lands, or cultural resources, and or uh, principles where you felt there was a conflict between what the federal law says and, and what the Navajo principles would have been? Yeah, I get this question a lot. <laughs> so, um, it, and it's a multi-layered answer. One is, um, it was important to me as a native person to assume roles that 
or in mainstream society and to understand how the dominant society thinks about these things. And I actually feel like now that I know that, I am much more, I am much more informed as an advocate for tribes now. Um, secondly, I'm a lawyer. So as any lawyer, uh, you represent your client. So I was representing interior department and sometimes there were instances where we could not do what the tribes would want to do, what they wanted. But the one thing that I felt was important in that instance was to meet with the tribe, to tell them why we couldn't do what they wanted, to talk about other options or pathways to get to where they wanted to be. And in my almost eight years of service, I did have to tell some tribes at times we couldn't do what they wanted. But I, I, it was really heartening that when we would sit down and talk about it, every single time the tribal leader said, Hillary, thank you, we're disappointed, but we appreciate you talking to us and telling us we've been waiting 10 years to have this conversation and you're honest with us. And I think that while it was difficult to deliver hard news, I think that is a large part of what has been missing is having that, you know, honest, straightforward, transparent communication um, with tribal leaderships. And so I thought, you know, that was important to me. And, you know, lastly, I think that it is Im important to see as a result of seeing where we couldn't do certain things that was that you know would be important for Indian country. It helped us identify where we need to make changes in the policy and the law, uh, which is really illuminating. Yeah. It can, yeah, it can help you see where that change can happen moving forward. But let me ask a question that kind of follows up on that uh, changes in the policies. This one's from Natalie Festa. And the question is, how can the federal government better involve indigenous stakeholders in environmental policy making? I believe what's essential is to have the trust responsibility be the guiding light for the entire government. A lot of times interior was viewed as the only one with the trust responsibility. And the US is a trustee there are certain obligations and duties that come with that. And it needs to be throughout government. We need to address the issue of adequate funding for tribes. My tribe, as many of you know, like other tribes, had a horrible, unbelievable fight against COVID. And, you know, CDC was telling people to wash your hands. And my tribe, 30 to 40% of residents do not have running water. And that is unacceptable in this day and age. And meanwhile, so here's a good example. Indian water rights settlements can take decades to resolve. And, and the way we've been doing it is you have to settle the Indian water rights before Congress gives the money to build the drinking water system. And I have now come to the conclusion that that's not workable. Um, we need to have government, Congress, ensure that the permanent homelands for tribes have adequate standards of living. Um, so that's a way we can could, engage. Could, could you say just a, a little bit more about what it means to have a trustee relationship? Yeah, I was thinking when I said that, um, you know, uh, it's, so I won't get into the legal stuff, but US Supreme Court, it's bedrock law that the United States has a trust responsibility to the over 500 Indian tribes in the country, Alaska natives too. It's in hundreds of laws. Um, there's treaties as well. 
many tribes have treaties that say we will provide health care, education, permanent homeland. And so the trust responsibility is the United States has made commitments to the tribes to provide for those things that ensure that, and that was often a trade for giving up land. And that's the, it's a legal binding concept. There is a lot of litigation around this question. All those cases I talked about that we settled at the core of that was a lot of litigation about how big of that duty exists. What's the scope of that duty? But it's there. And I think um, it's really important that the US operates and engage, engages with tribes. And you mentioned that, it, that, yeah. that sometimes it feels like DOI is the only part of government that's taking that trust relationship seriously when it should be in HHS and yes. agriculture and Army Corps, EPA, yeah. DOJ, yeah. And often DOJ is adverse, right? And saying, oh, we, we have a limited trust duty. Um, so, and OMB, <laughs> where and the do, budget is. Yeah, do you think there, um, are, there are there questions of, of law that are unsettled or is it really just that the policy has sort of uh, not been well aligned with what the law says? It's, I believe that you can have a robust trust relationship with tribes and assume duties and responsibilities as a matter of policy. You can say we are going to interpret our duty broadly. The legal side determines whether or not the United States has to pay money damages if they breach the trust. So if they fail to manage grazing rights for a tribe, I'm just giving you a simple example. Can the tribe enforce that breach of trust? Can they force the government to do a better job managing their grazing lands? Can they force the government to pay back, you know, damages for failing to do that? That's where the legal debates arise. Okay, well, I'm going to ask another question that speaks to the same issue. This one also from someone I don't have the name from, but Native and Indigenous activists have been gaining more prominence, especially following the protests at Standing Rock and now with Line 3. What's having Deb Holland as Secretary of Interior mean for how the Biden administration will respond to climate issues that so greatly impact Native communities? So I think it's going to bring a greater awareness and sensitivity and acknowledgement of tribal rights and perspectives. Uh, the Dakota Access, I worked on Dakota Access, um, that involves the Army Corps of Engineers. And one of the things that, you know, that, I, that was at the core of that case was the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe uh, and I wrote a legal opinion about their treaty rights and water rights downstream from the pipeline. Um, and so that created, you know, awareness of some of the legal issues at play. Um, and I think Deb Holland uh, and her team uh, will continue to raise those legal issues uh, when these uh, questions arise about land use and energy development. Um, so I think it's just, it's going to continue to enhance of the focus on those issues. Let me ask a question about a, a different aspect of lands management. And uh, th this one's from Margaret Krebs. It says, how might we implement the idea of giving back uh, national parks or, or other federal lands to Native Americans is that a is that a, a direction that you see being pursued, maybe with success? You know, I think it's been talked about, uh, and it is getting increasing uh, traction. It would certainly take it. It would require an act of Congress. So the public lands are um, uh, under the property clause of the Constitution. Uh, Congress has delegated management authority to interior for the public lands. So you would need to have Congress 
change for certain parcels of land, they would have to say this is going back to this tribe to be held in trust, um, made a part of their reservation. So that's what it would require. Uh, I do think there are opportunities throughout the country where maybe that would be feasible, but you'd have to, you would have to get an act of Congress to approve it. Um, and that's why co-management is another avenue as well to, um, to, to have that shared management of certain areas like uh, the bison range, which was up in Montana which is managed by Fish and Wildlife Service. And then ultimately they said, you know, this should not be managed by us. It should be managed by the local tribe, Salish and Kootenai. And, um, and so they gave it back. They, they gave title to the land back or the responsibility for the management? The management. The management. So that's a case where you're talking about either co-management or transferring management without necessarily switching who has the title to the land form. Yeah, and I think, they actually did get an act of Congress to have it be managed by the tribe. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask a question that kind of goes in the different direction. What tribal perspectives can teach us? This question is from Julia Novi. Um, thank you for sharing your time with us. As you mentioned, native cultures and traditional knowledge has a great deal to teach us about resiliency and sustainability. How do you think we could dramatically increase a mindset of interconnectedness in the US? so mm -hmm. that the interdependence of our human environment systems is fundamentally understood and thus more integrated and inclusive and holistic approaches are embraced. Well, I think the country's going through a moment of reckoning, right? And awareness and seeing that there is it, there are different voices and cultures and perspectives that have not been, um, you know, given a, a place in American society uh, to be heard and learned from. And I hope with the focus on climate and the new goals of the Biden administration for clean energy and innovation and all of that, uh, also frankly, corporate America is getting involved, right, with ESG governance and, um, you know, institutional investors are looking to corporations to think about these issues. So I think all of that uh, will hopefully, hopefully uh, have folks look to other solutions. And I do think the kind of Western linear thinking of how to solve problems um, there's a lot of good in that, obviously, right? But there's a lot of good in the more multidisciplinary focus as well and thinking about um, future generations and where is what we're going to do today? How's that going to affect um, humanity in the future? Um, who are the folks that are left behind? You know, who, who are folks, you know, we take for granted we have clean water, running water, uh, clean air. Uh, we can go to an open space and hike. There's a lot of people who don't have that, right? So it's finding those disparities and finding ways to bring new knowledge into the equation to help tackle those problems. I, I can tell from the questions that your comments today have really inspired a lot of people. We only have time for one or two more questions, and I'm going to to turn to some of these career advice ones. Uh, here's yeah, one sure. From, from Benjamin Franta. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today. I was wondering if you have any advice for non-Native lawyers or others who might be representing or working with Native American tribes. Yeah, and um, first of all, that's great. Uh, we need all the allies and supporters we can get. It's important to go out to reservation communities and you know spend some time there, spend time with um, folks in the tribal community uh, listen is really important uh, to be an observer and listen. And as a lawyer, it's really important to, you know, take time to see like what is the end goal of the tribe? 
what are they looking for long term um, and have those conversations and create and build some of that trust and synergy uh, and don't come in with like a solution or a transaction right off the bat. Have, you know, sit down, have a meal, hang out, takes time. Yeah. And, and there are other questions that are along a similar line, but, but asking mm -hmm. about uh, careers in environmental policy. Are there yeah. particular things that people who are yeah. students now should be thinking about or doing? Oh, learn from legends. I, I was lucky. I had so many great legendary folks like Buzz Thompson and Reed Chambers and, and others guide me. I think that's really important. Uh, also, I, do, I am a fan of public service. I think getting, you know, I, most of my career was in public service. I love private sector now. I'm learning so much, which is, I'm answering the question. Uh, do some public service, but do a lot of different things, you know, um, and make it something that you're, you feel passionate about every day. Work with organizations, clients, people that share your values. I think that's important too. Well, sure. I've really enjoyed talking with you. There are a whole bunch of questions that we didn't get to, <laughs> but I also want to make sure that you have a chance to just provide any thoughts that that sort of tie this together or, or threads that I should have brought up that I missed. Oh, uh, this is wonderful. Really great conversation. And I would just say, um, really important in my view to support the next generation that's coming through the ranks, be it through law school or in other disciplines, um, because there are a lot of tricky problems we're facing today and it's really coming to the fore uh, we're seeing in society. And so um, give them support and guidance uh, because I know people did that for me and it made an incredible change and in, in difference in my life. Um, and don't be afraid to think big too. Uh, we need big thinkers and creative thinkers. Um, so, and I know uh, you all have great thoughts too about how to tackle these tricky problems. So. Well, Hillary Tompkins, thank you so much for spending the hour with us. Your um, career has been inspiring and we certainly wish you the best in all the future challenges you tackle. You tackle. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody.